Well, please open your Bibles at John in chapter 7 that has been read for us. We saw last week that the brothers of Jesus did not believe in Him, but they felt that he could, they could tell Him how His ministry would be more effective. Go show yourself to the world, they said, to which Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. And we saw that one day Jesus Christ will show Himself to the world. He will come in power and glory, but that time has not come yet, and until it does, we walk by faith and not by sight. So, turning away from the advice that the brothers gave to Him, Jesus did not go up to Jerusalem publicly. It was not the time for Him to show Himself to the world, but He did go up to Jerusalem for this Feast of Booths privately, verse 10. So, when the brothers and the convoy of people from their community arrive in Jerusalem and Jesus is not with them in the convoy, people wanted to know where He was. Verse 11, the Jews were looking for Him at the feast and saying, where is He? But then about the middle of the feast, verse 14, we are told that Jesus went up to the temple. He goes discreetly, He goes privately, but He goes to the temple and He begins teaching. It seems that at this point, our Lord Jesus really kept a low profile. Picture Him in the outer courts of the temple where there are vast crowds of people, He's not standing on a public platform. He's simply engaging with different groups of people in conversation. He teaches, and some people respond, and then he moves on, and he engages with another group, and there's some conversation, and then he moves on. And not until the last day of the feast that we'll come to God willing next week in verse 37, then he stands up with a loud voice and makes a very public proclamation. So, we're going to look in these verses at these days in which Jesus was moving among different groups, and there were very, very different reactions to Jesus. I want you to see that in verse 12, for example, there was much muttering about Him. I love that phrase, much muttering. Um, You can just get the sense of it. People are Jesus has become a topic of conversation, and while some said He is a good man, others said, no, He is leading the people astray. So, there you have a kind of summary of the division of opinion that there was among the people in these various groups in the temple when Jesus went there. More specifically, verse 15, some marveled. Uh, About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple, He began teaching, and the Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he himself has never studied? But while some marveled, other people mocked. And you have that in verse 34. You will seek Me, Jesus says, and you will not find Me, and where I am you cannot come. And the Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? That is pure cynicism. Jesus, of course, is speaking of heaven. Where he goes, they cannot come. But they respond with pure cynicism and say, oh, uh, where is he going to go that we can't come? Perhaps he's going on some world tour where, in all the places where Jewish people are dispersed, and uh, he's going to convert the whole world, I guess. And pure cynicism. So, verse 43, there was a division among the people over Him. Very striking statement in verse 43. That's how it was then. That's how it is now. That's how it always will be to all eternity. There was a division over Him. And to show you how intense this division of opinion about the Lord Jesus Christ was, if you look in verse 41, you will see there that some said, He is the Christ. But if you look at verse 20, you'll see that others said, He has a demon. Now, you can't get a more divergent opinion than that. He's the Christ, some say. In other words, He is the one on whom on whom all the hopes of the world depend, the one, therefore, who is to be received and to be welcomed with joy. And others say, 
he is a demon. In other words, he's a source of evil. We have to get him out of here because there's no place for what he represents here in this community. There was a division among him, them over him. Verse 30, some were seeking to arrest him, but verse 31, yet many of the people believed in him. Now, as we see the very diverse reactions to the Lord Jesus Christ, here's the question that I think very obviously comes before us today from these verses. How can you know what is true in a world of competing voices? Because we are still living today in a world in which there are all kinds of opinions about Jesus Christ. We are living in a world in which relentless voices are proclaiming opinions to us and the question that we live with is this, how can you discern, how can you know what is true in a world of multiple competing and contradictory opinions? And I want to draw your attention especially to verse 24, which I think is the key verse in this long section in which we're told repeatedly about the diverse opinions to which people came with regards to Jesus. Look at verse 24, do not judge by appearances, Jesus says, but judge with right judgment. People are making all kinds of judgments about Jesus, and here's how He responds. He says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Now, the obvious question is, how do you do that? How do you judge with right judgment? In a world of many competing voices, how do you grow in discernment how in a world of competing opinions and convictions do you come to know and to discern the truth? And I want to lay before you today from these verses three very simple questions that will help you in knowing the truth. That's the issue that's before us. How can you make right judgment? How can you come to a true knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to suggest to you three questions and principles that lie behind them as we walk through this passage together. How can you know? Here's the first question. Am I listening to the Word of God? You want to make a right judgment? You want to be able to discern and to know and to be confident in what is true? Ask this question of yourself, am I listening to the Word of God? Because the person who judges by appearances, Jesus says, do not do that, don't judge by appearances. The person who judges by appearances makes superficial judgments about Jesus. But the person who exercises right judgment, Jesus says, judge with right judgment, that's what you want to do that person listens to Jesus. Now, that's the significance of why we're told repeatedly that Jesus was in these outer courts of the temple, and what was He doing? Not miracles, but teaching. Remember, the brothers had said, show yourself to the world. Go to Jerusalem, and you'll make the most marvelous impression if you go and do some miracles there. And Jesus turns away from that advice, no, this is not my time to show myself to the world. He does go to Jerusalem, not publicly, but privately, and in this discreet way, He begins teaching. Notice it in verse 14, about the middle of the feast, He went up to the temple and He began teaching. Verse 16, Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but Him who sent me. Verse 28, so Jesus proclaimed as He taught in the temple. So, Jesus is teaching, and the question is, who's listening? Some are listening, and others, they're just judging by appearances. 
Now, let me give you a couple of examples of people who were making superficial judgments about Jesus in the way that people still often make superficial judgments about Him today. If you look in verse 41 and verse 42, you'll see some people who feel that they've found a barrier to believing. This is why I can't believe. Some were saying, this is the Christ, verse 41. But others said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Now, here are thoughtful people, and here are people who actually know something about the Scripture. They've looked at the Scripture, and they know from the Old Testament Scripture that the Messiah, when He comes, is to be born in Bethlehem. They know of Jesus, that He was raised in Nazareth, and evidently the family home was now in Galilee. That's where the ministry of Jesus was. And so, they're saying, look, there's something that doesn't fit here. We, we, we can't believe in Him because there's something that we've seen even in the Bible that we just can't get over that's a barrier to belief for us. Um, now, of course, a little further investigation would have shown that Jesus was indeed born in Bethlehem. By the way, what an amazing thing it was that God used the decree of a pagan Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be taxed and therefore required that everyone go back to their town of family origin, which meant that Joseph and Mary, at the most inconvenient of times when she was just about to give birth to our Savior, had to go from where they were living to Bethlehem, and in that way, the remarkable prophecy of Scripture was fulfilled. By the way, notice this principle, that the way, over, the way to overcome any barrier to believing is to get to know Jesus Christ better. You see, they, they, they found something in the Bible, they, I can't get over this. There are still people today, you know, I got this problem I've seen in the Bible, I can't get over this, I can't believe because of this. And the way to overcome every barrier to believing is to get to know better Jesus Christ. I, I was speaking to a woman just this week. She used such a striking phrase. She had grown up in an abusive home. Her father was an alcoholic, and he was often violent. And this is what she said to me this week. She said, I painted my father's face onto God. I said, that's a very striking phrase. I've never heard anyone say that before. I painted my father's face onto God. The face of violence. And then she said, as the years went by, whenever there was something ugly that happened in life, I painted that onto God. How then could she ever believe in a God of love? And I said to her, how was it that you came to faith then? And she said, I began listening to the words of Jesus. I began listening to the words of Jesus, and she saw that Jesus was very different from her father. And when she came to believe that Jesus was God with us, she came to a very different conclusion about God. Now, you see, the person who judges by appearances, the person who judges by a superficial judgment, this is what happens. 
that an experience that is very painful, a question that seems unanswerable, just gets painted onto the face of God and becomes then the reason why faith is regarded as implausible, and I've made my decision, and there's nothing more to be said about it. That's exactly what's happening here. Here are some good people, and they're saying, well, we know that, Jesus, that the Messiah must come from Bethlehem, and, and Jesus comes from Galilee. End of matter. They needed to get to know Jesus better. And the way to overcome every barrier to faith is to get to know Jesus Christ better. Let me give you another example of superficial judgment that comes in these fascinating verses in John and chapter 7. This isn't so much about a barrier to faith. This is about a prejudice against faith, and you have it in verse 48. Here are the Pharisees speaking. And they say here, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in Him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now, that is pure elitism. That is sheer snobbery of the worst sort. It's rather like, you know, the sort of phrase that gets thrown around today, no scientist today believes this, that kind of thing, you see. Um, only common ignorant people would ever think that this is true. That's the kind of intellectual snobbery that is being expressed by these Pharisees who look down on everybody else. This crowd, of course, there's plenty of people in the crowd believe in Him, but they're uneducated. They don't even know the law. I mean, they're accursed, aren't they? You can't get more despising than that. But which of the real opinion makers and former, uh, opinion formers in, in our culture really believe this? Have any of the Pharisees believed in Him? Well, actually, the answer to that is yes. And one of them's standing right there while this elitism is going on. And guess what his name is? Nicodemus. Verse 50, Nicodemus who had gone to him before and was one uh, uh, and who was one of them said to them does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does of course they dismiss him immediately you know my goodness what are you talking about why is nicodemus different from those who are prejudiced against faith answer because he had the humility to come by night and sit and listen to Jesus. Now, we're trying to get at the answer to this very important question. How can you know the truth? In a world of competing opinion, how can you know the truth, and especially the truth in regards to the Lord Jesus Christ? And he's saying to us, don't judge by appearances, judge by right judgment. That means don't take a superficial view of things, but listen to what Jesus Himself actually says. And there is a fascinating story right here in these verses of some people who did that, and perhaps it's the most surprising group of all. If you look at verse 32, the Pharisees are beginning to get feedback from what's going on in these various conversations in the outer courts of the temple. And Jesus is here, and now He's been speaking to various people, even keeping a low profile. And so they decide, verse 32, to send out the officers to arrest Him. So now here are the temple guard. Picture these military kind of people, the security squad, and they're sent out by the Pharisees with direct orders, you go, you arrest Jesus, bring Him in, and let's be done with this right now. It seems, as you follow the story, that the officers arrived on the last day of the feast when, in verse 37, we're told that Jesus stood up, and in a loud voice, He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, for whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 
And the words that Jesus spoke when these security people arrived made such an impression on them that they went back to the Pharisees without arresting Jesus. Verse 45, the officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. Now, I'm telling you, or rather asking you, if the words of the Lord Jesus Christ can bring about that kind of transformation in the heavy mob of security guards who had gone out to arrest Him, and they hear His words, and they think, I, we have never heard anyone speak like this. We're not going to lay a hand on Him. If the words of Jesus can bring about that kind of transformation in men like that, what would the words of Jesus be able to do by way of transformation in your life too? You want to know the truth? You don't judge by superficial judgment. What are other people saying? What's the peer group on about? Oh, I've come across this problem, and I've held on to it for five or ten years, and it's my reason for not believing. I've never really investigated it very further, very much further, but uh, that's my reason why I do not believe. Listen to Jesus. You want to know the truth? You listen to the Son of God. Second question. You want to know the truth? Am I listening to the Word of God? Second, am I asking for the help of God? Here's the second thing you want to do. As you seek the truth, especially as it relates to Jesus, you, you listen to His words, and then you ask for God's help in understanding. And again, let me put the principle this way, that those who judge by appearances uh, assume, very simply assume, their own competence to judge. Oh, yeah, we can come to a conclusion about this. But those who judge with right judgment, remember Jesus says, don't judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Those who judge with right judgment know that they need the help of God. Now, the Bible is very, very clear on this point that as human beings, we do not in and of ourselves as fallen human beings have the capacity to rightly discern the truth. Listen to how it's stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned not able to discern them. It, it's not within our fallen human capacity to be able to discern the things of God. We need the help of God to be able to know and to grasp the things of God. Jesus said it this way in Matthew in chapter 11, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you have revealed them to little children. So, here are the Pharisees in their arrogance saying, oh, of course, the people in the crowd, they're completely uneducated, and who's going to take the fact that they believe seriously at all as any of the Pharisees believed in Him? And Jesus says, here's the explanation that God in His eternal wisdom has hidden these things from those who arrogantly assume that we are in a position to judge, but He has revealed them to those who humbly seek after Him. That's the principle. Now, our natural assumption, our fallen assumption, the assumption of our flesh is always, first, that we have an intuitive ability to know God that we all know God in our own way. You hear this sort of thing all the time, that our own experience will just intuitively lead us to the truth about God, and that we all have the ability to know who God is. But notice that Jesus says, verse 28, He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. You don't know God. That's what Jesus says. 
you don't know Him. So if you're going to come to know Him, you're lacking the capacity, you're going to have to ask for help. That's the point. Then our natural assumption, our instinct, is not only that we know God by intuition, but that we're all basically good at heart, and we hear that all around us as well. You know, while we all fail in many ways, that, of course, is just, you know, our mess-ups are kind of on the surface, but if you dig down deep enough into any person, you'll find the good core that's at the middle in the end. But Jesus says something very different. Verse 19, has not Moses given you a law, yet none of you keeps the law? You don't know God, and you don't keep the law. And our third natural assumption, first, oh, yeah, we all intuitively know God, and we all do it in our own way, and yeah, we're all good at heart, and, and therefore, of course, in the light of these things, our natural fallen human assumption is that in the end, our good will outweigh our bad, and all will be well with us when we finally leave this world and we enter into eternity. But Jesus says something very different. He says, verse 33, I will be with you just a little longer, and then I'm going to Him who sent me, and you'll seek me, and you'll not find me, because where I am you cannot come. So, do you see you've got two different worlds here? People who are judged by appearances will just assume that I got the competence to judge this. I can work out in my own way the great truths and mysteries about God, and I'm basically good at heart, and everything's going to be right with me in the end, surely, isn't it? And Jesus says, the one who sent me is true, but you don't know Him, and you don't keep the law, and where I'm going, you cannot come. Therefore, a person who wants to know the truth cannot come with an air of moral superiority boasting our own competence. It's not going to work to say, well, I can come and I can judge all this. I know I can work it all out. The person who wants to know the truth about Jesus has to come to the Bible humbly. And we're given this marvelous promise that I want to lay before you today for your encouragement in seeking after the truth. Psalm 25 and verse 9 tells us that God leads the humble in what is right, and He teaches the humble His way. Can you just take that in for a moment? That God leads and God teaches the humble. In other words, if you will humble yourself as one who will listen to the words of Jesus, rather than bringing all your prejudices and all your objections, become teachable in learning from Jesus Christ, God Himself says, I'll lead you. I'll teach you. You don't have the competence within yourself to come to know God. None of us does. You don't have the ability to open up an entrance into heaven or to live the life that is pleasing to God. But if you will come with humility, God Himself will lead you. If God Himself leads you, you will come to know the truth. God Himself will teach you, and if God Himself teaches you, you will come to know the truth. So, we're asking the question in a world of diverse opinion in which all kinds of conclusions about what is true are being thrown at us all the time, how can you grow in discernment? How can we be people who become settled in regards to the truth? How can we know it? How can we pursue it? And we're saying it has to be by listening to the Word of God, and it has to be by asking the help of God. Is that what you're doing? And then there's one more thing. Am I submitting to the will of God? And here the principle again is very simple. The person who judges by appearances focuses on opinion. The person who judges with right judgment knows the power of the will. And I want you to see the very important statement of verse 17. Listen to what Jesus says. 
if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God. If your will is to do God's will, you will know. In other words, in order to know, you have to will. You say, now, isn't it the other way around? Don't we have to work it all out? Don't we have to get it all settled? Don't we have to know it all before we're going to desire to do it? No, Jesus says, you're never going to come to a true and settled knowledge. You will never come to a true knowledge of Jesus Christ unless and until there is a desire in your heart to follow after the path on which He leads you. This is what that means, that knowing the truth can never be a purely intellectual quest, because what you think will always be shaped by what you desire. And if you are to come to know the truth with regards to the Lord Jesus Christ, there has to be within the will a desire to follow after God's way. This is what Jesus said a little earlier in John and chapter 5 and verse 44, where He says to the Pharisees, now how can you believe when you are seeking glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. You don't have any desire within you to seek that which comes from God. And because you have no desire to seek that which comes from God, how are you ever going to come to believe? That's the argument that Jesus is making in John chapter 5 and verse 44. And here He's saying exactly the same thing. If anyone's will is to do God's will, then he will know. In order to know, you have to will. So, here's the question, and it's a convicting question. Do you then really want to know the truth about Jesus? Do you? Not everyone does. Some people do not want to know the truth. We're told that in Romans in chapter 1 very clearly. Men who by unrighteousness suppress the truth. Paul says some people actually push the truth down. If there really is a God, I don't want to know Him, because that would have profound implications for my life that I am not willing to consider. Well, there's no path to faith so long as that is the condition. That's what Jesus is saying. But He says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know. It is simply not possible to find the knowledge of God and the peace and joy that He offers if your heart is bent on sinning. It's just not possible. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In order to know, you have to will. And that's why in the Old Testament, we have this marvelous prophecy of Jeremiah. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's when you'll find me. You want to find me? Your will? If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know. There's an old story from back in the UK where there are out in the countryside all kinds of old and sometimes ancient stone church buildings, some of them very beautiful, some of them in ruins, some of them still kept in quite good repair. And the story is of two friends, one who was a Christian and the other who was a skeptic. And these two friends were out walking in the countryside when they came to an old stone chapel with beautiful stained glass windows. And when they went up, the door was open, and so the two of them went inside to have a look. 
And on the wall at the front of this chapel, there were two large plaques with writing on them. The one on the left at the front of the church had the words of the creed, and the one on the right had the words of the Ten Commandments. And the skeptic pointed to the words of the creed, and he said to his Christian friend, this I cannot believe. And his friend pointed to the words of the Ten Commandments and said, maybe it's because these you will not obey. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know. He will know. One more story and then we're through. There's a story that's told by Rebecca Manley Pippert, who served for many years with InterVarsity Fellowship here in the States, working with uh, students. And I read this story many, many years ago. It has always stayed with me because it was striking to me then and is still helpful to me now. So, let me relate it to you as best I can. Um, but first, just a quote from what Rebecca Pippert says, do you want to discover who Jesus is and deal honestly with your doubts? Jesus' style, she says, is not to suggest that you go and ponder the virgin birth for three months, but to begin doing what He says. That's the principle of John 7, verse 17. Then she tells this story. It's the story of Sue, a university student who said that she was an agnostic. Her best friend became a Christian while at university, and uh, the change in his life clearly had an effect and got Sue's attention. But she was faced with this question that's really what we've been speaking about from the Bible tonight, how can I really know if Christianity is true? So, she came to Becky Pippert and asked for advice, and she said this, I, I've seen what Jesus has done for my friend, but I have many questions and doubts. What should I do? And then she said, please don't ask me to say a prayer to receive Jesus, because that just wouldn't be honest. She wasn't at a place of believing this at that point. And here's what Becky said, tell God or tell the four walls, if that's what you think you're speaking to, that you really want to know if Jesus is God, and that if you could feel more certain, you would follow Him. Then, begin to read the Gospels every day, and each day you read, something will probably hit you and make sense. Whatever that is, do it as soon as you can. So, Sue says, that sounds radical but I'll try. A few days later, Sue reads in her Bible, if someone steals your coat, don't let him have only that, but offer your cloak as well. She says, for whatever reason, that verse hit me between the eyes. So, I said, God, if you're there, I'm going to do what this verse says. If the opportunity arises today, I want to remind you that I am trying to do things your way in order to find out if you really exist and if Jesus really is who He says He is. Amen. She adds, the day went by and I forgot the verse. Then she describes how in the evening she went to the library to work on her thesis. She arrives at her designated desk in the library, and another student comes up to her and starts yelling. He told me that the school hadn't given him a desk, and he was going to take mine. I started yelling back, and pretty soon there was quite a loud argument in the library. But it was when he glared at me and said, look, I'm stealing it from you whether you like it or not, that I said, oh, no. 
I can't believe it. I thought to myself, God, if you're there, and I do want to know if Jesus really is God, but isn't there some other way of finding this out besides obeying this verse? But I couldn't escape from the fact that I had read the verse that very same morning, and now this person was trying to rob me. I took a deep breath, tried not to swear, and said, okay, you can have the desk. At this point, the librarian arrives because there's been a, an argument, a loud argument that's going on in the library, and the librarian knew, of course, to whom the desk belonged. So, she comes to try and sort this rumpus out, and when the conversation has ended, Sue says, he can have the desk. When the librarian leaves, this guy grabs her by the arm and says to her, why in the world did you let me have it? Quote, I told him he'd think I'd really flipped out, but I was trying to discover if Jesus really was who he claimed to be. And I was attempting to do this by doing the things that he told us to do. I've been reading what he says in the Gospels, and today I read that if someone tried to rip me off, I was supposed to let them and even throw in something else to boot. All I could see was the whites of his eyes. <laughs> so, I'm going to give you the desk, I said, but don't press your luck on something else. <laughs> then he said, why in the world would Jesus say such a thing? And I said, if there's one thing I've learned about read, from reading about Jesus, it's that He would give you a whole lot more than a desk if you'd let Him. And Sue says, as I said those words, I simply knew that it was all true. Now, if you're getting hung up on trying to rationalize you know, standing up to bullies and all this kind of thing, you have completely missed the point. Here was a young woman who sincerely from the heart willed to do God's will. And by that means, one who was listening to the words of Jesus, humbly asking the help of Jesus, submitting herself as best she was able to discern what that meant to the will of Jesus, found that Jesus brought her to a place where she knew. How are you going to know the truth? In a world of competing and contradictory voices and opinions, listen to the Word of God. Ask for the help of God Submit yourself to the will of God, for He says, you will seek Me and you will find Me when you seek Me with all your heart. Father, take away pretense. Remove our supposed barriers to faith that sometimes are held onto, and our prejudices against faith, and our suppression of the truth because we don't want to contemplate the possible consequences. And grant that with humility we may come to the place where You are the one who teaches and leads us, so that by miracles of Your grace we may come to know the truth of who Jesus is and to find the life that He offers and to enter into the joy now and for eternity that belongs to those who are Christ's alone. And these things we ask for our Savior's sake and everyone together said, Amen.